Hey, I'm Brad. And this is the third week of our Further Up and Further In series, where we're learning how to experience the presence and power of God more every day. I want to start today with a question. Do you want to grow a deep and personal relationship with God? Do you want it? Like, do, do you actually, do you want to have a, a more acute awareness of his presence in your life? Do you want to find your life centered on his good news and his peace so that his truth rules your heart more and more each day instead of being blown and tossed around by what's going on around you, what people are saying, what the voices in your head try to accuse you of? Do you want to hear God's voice more clearly? Do you want to find yourself released from guilt and shame and filled with purpose and direction, even when the world around you looks like it's spinning out of control? Then you're going to have to set aside specific time every single day, every single day, every single, every single day to spend time with Jesus because he embodies everything you're longing for. Everything you're longing for. So we've been talking about what a quiet time, what that devotional time is. I used this definition last week. I'm going to add a little bit to it this week as I I kind of thought it through. Uh, A quiet time or a devotion time, whatever you want to call it, your time with God, your God time, is a special block of time set apart for personal interaction with God so I can know Him better. Okay, so the the purpose of this is I want to know him better. This is what's happening over time. How do I get to know him? By interacting with him. Not just by reading about him, but by interacting with him. Interacting with this one that embodies everything I long for, who is the source of all life and peace, and whom I normally ignore throughout my day because I'm just too busy to spend time with him. Man, I want to change that. If that's you today, or if that's been you, the story of your life, if you've had all kind of false starts, like your exercise routines, where you get into your devotional routine that starts for a couple of days and then stops, peters out, I want to free you of that. One of the ways I'm going to do that is by showing you, like I've been saying, the exact process, the exact kind of framework that I'm using in my time with God that gives me all those things that I was just talking about on a daily basis. So we also talked about the purpose of a daily quiet time. And I, my, I frame this a little differently than maybe you're used to. Instead of uh, I'm trying to get centered with God or it's time to pray or it's time to read my Bible, the purpose of a quiet time is reflected by the fact that there are two parties involved in this quiet time. There's the purpose I bring to the table and there's the purpose God brings to the table because we're interacting, right? There's more than one person, even though we behave like there's only us. And so the purpose of a quiet time is they help me give myself more fully to God so he can transform me into Christ's image. There's nothing I need more than to know Jesus more fully and be transformed into his image. The more I'm like Jesus, the more I can stand above my problems instead of getting slogged down in them. The more I'm like Jesus, the more patient I will be, the more faith-filled I will be, the more loving I will be, all the things I crave and long for. So again, why would we not spend time with him every single day? I do, and I need it. I need it, I need it. Now, uh, I've been talking about how the, the framework that I use is actually a pathway that's written through the structure, the frame, the, the backbone of the Bible itself, all the way from Exodus to Revelation. So it spans thousands of years of biblical history. It's more than just one passage here or there. It's the, the blueprint of the tabernacle and later the temple that Jesus would then fulfill. This tabernacle blueprint, this temple blueprint shows us with steps in a pathway. Here's how to approach God. Here's how to connect with God in such a way that he can have more of you and transform you into his image in such a way that you can't help but interact with him and be changed by him and get to know him better. So that's what we're talking about. So good. Jesus uh, inspired the writer of the Hebrews to write this about this way that he opened up. Look at this. We have confidence now, like we didn't have before, because they would have died if they had tried to go into the holy place, most holy place. But we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Now, 
Let me just pause for a minute. And, and again, I'm trying to anticipate kind of some people's objections because I have a feeling like not all of you are just running off and doing this. And some of you, it, you still actually may not be convinced at a heart level that you truly need him. And, and that's the reason you're not diving into this. Some of you might be resisting because you're like, I don't want to do it that way. Like, who is Brad to tell me how to do my quiet time with God? And I'm trying to tell you that I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm showing you how the Bible outlines that we should do it, okay? Now, what I'm doing each week is there's two parts. There's, there's what the scripture says, and then there's what I have learned from over 30 years of walking with God. Now, as, as much as I want to say that 30 years is valuable wisdom that, that I think you'd be silly to just pass over, my, my specific applications are not scripture. They're not inspired the same way that, that the scriptures are, because the scriptures are perfect, and so we need to let the scriptures inform us. Um, but I want to tell you that there is a way to do your devotion. There's a way to connect with God. Again, the way we connect with God in our daily devotions is the way that we connect with God throughout life. These are the same, they're one and the same thing. Now, again, some of us, when we hear the word way, and I actually probably just did it a minute ago, we think of how. In our Western minds, we think a way means you're telling me how to do it. But in the Hebrew mind, a way wasn't necessarily how, it was describing a pathway. Literally, they would talk about paths as your way. So the way that people travel, or the way that most people travel along a certain route, eventually becomes a pathway, becomes a road, it gets trodden down, and you can actually follow the way other people go because you can see where they have walked. That's a way. What the Bible actually teaches is that God has ways. And that our ways are generally not his ways. So to say, I want to do it my way is basically saying, I'm not going to do it God's way. So I'm trying to break that in you in, before we get into our content here this morning. So what happens in scripture is we, we have these rebellious people that need to repent of their wicked ways. Why? Because God's ways are higher and they're right and they're good. In fact, the prophet Hosea says this. He says, the ways of the Lord are right. <laughs> so if you say, I want to do my devotions my way, I want to approach God my way, fine, but God's way or the highway, because his ways are right. The righteous, he says, walk in them. The ones that are right with God walk in his ways. Why? Because they're living in harmony with God. They understand God's ways are right. My ways are not. So if my ways are different than God's ways, I need to change the way I'm living and the way I'm going and the way I do things so that I do things God's way because God's ways are right. That's how I want to walk. So the prophet Micah actually says, there's a promise. He will teach us his ways. Why? So that we may walk in his paths. Uh, God has paths, guys. God, God walks certain ways. There are paths that God travels. And in our Western kind of rubric or the way we kind of talk, there are ways that God works. There's, there's a how he does things. And if you want to get in line with God and you want to experience more of God, you've got to do things his way. Not because he's some despotic leader that always has to get his way or else. It's because his ways are right. They're good. They're pleasing. They're perfect. And so this is what we're doing. So then Moses, one of the, the Old Testament saints who knew God in ways that we can't even comprehend. This is what Moses prayed. He said to God, teach me your ways that I might know you and continue to find favor with you. I'm tracking with you here, God. You know, I want to keep this up. Like, I want to get to know you better. So show me the ways that you walk because I will take that path. I will lay down all my, my ways and the ways that I think and the ways that I choose, and I will choose your way instead. If you were living in Hollywood, and you wanted to meet a movie star. I don't know if Brad Pitt lives in Hollywood, but let's say, let's say you lived in Hollywood or you lived in the area, maybe you're there for a week or two, and you really, really wanted to meet Brad Pitt. What's the best way to meet Brad Pitt? Is it to look for his number in the phone book? Probably not, because there's no such thing as phone books but anymore. <laughs> but, but probably not because, right, you're not, he's probably going to be an unlisted number. So how do you find Brad Pitt? How do you spend time with Brad Pitt? 
Well, you might want to do some research. You want to read some interviews and you find out, oh, he really loves the coffee shop on 5th and, you know, 5th and whatever. So, <laughs> so anyways, you find out there's a coffee shop and you go, certain, sh sure enough, there it is. There's that coffee shop. So what's the best way to spend time with Brad Pitt if he's not out of the country? You go to that coffee shop in the morning about the time when he's supposed to be there and you will run into him. Why? Because you've learned his ways. Right? So if you want to bump into God more, you may want to walk his paths because eventually he's going to be walking that path and he's going to bump into you. This is, this is really cool, right? So what we've been talking about, just again, is this temple flow. And so far in this, temp, this blueprint that God gave us for how to approach him, his way, which is a new and living way available to us, open to us, right? And he was the pioneer and he says, follow me. And so he wants us to take this way. We've, we've talked about starting with ascent, which is all about pouring our heart out to God, venting to him. And our interaction with God there is as we vent to God and pour our hearts out to him, he then takes hold of more and more of our hearts. And then as we enter the gates with thanksgiving, we are thanking God and he is reminding us of what he's done so that we are reminded that, that he is faithful. And then as we t make the connection between what he has done and who he is, we begin to praise him and realize that he is worthy of our trust because he has been faithful. And, and this is really important because all of this is a flow. All of this is a building up to. Everything in the temple is a crescendo. That's why the steps ascend. So what, what you need to go into the court of priests is you need this sense that God is worthy to be trusted, that he has been faithful in the past because what comes next is going to hurt. <laughs> it's going to offend you because it's about our sin and your sin and my sin. So this, this court of priests is actually about confession and repentance. I come into the court of priests ready to confess my sin and repent of them. I'm going to explain these terms today and next week. And, and in exchange, God is going to offer something called forgiveness to me. This transforming uh, power of forgiveness. But I, I want to stop again. I want to pause again. Just take a minute and ask yourself, what is forgiveness? What is forgiveness? I'm serious. Take a minute and in your mind, come up with a definition. What is forgiveness? Some of you are not actually thinking it through. You're just thinking of what people have told you in the past. It's okay to start. What is forgiveness? Somewhere, somewhere out there, someone has said, it's a decision. And, and it, yes, it is a decision, but so is taking up knitting. That's a decision. So it's not just a decision. So what else is it to, uh, what, what's forgiveness? Choosing to let go of my feelings, hard feelings towards someone. Maybe someone, I see that hand. Yeah. What is forgiveness? I'm going to give you a definition today of forgiveness that probably will break your box. Not because I, I'm not saying what you're saying is wrong. I'm saying that maybe what you think about forgiveness is incomplete. And the reason I can guess that is that almost every single Christian I've ever met, including many pastors, their understanding of forgiveness is incomplete. And so what I want to try to do is give you a broader, more majestic view of forgiveness, what happens there in the court of priests, because this is one of my favorite places in the temple flow. I can hardly wait to get there. I can hardly wait because it hurts so good because of what God is going to do in my life as a result. So here's my definition of forgiveness in a couple of steps. Number one, forgiveness is an exchange. Forgiveness is an exchange. It's not just a decision. Remember, I'm interacting with God. It's, forgiveness is, is not just something I do. It's something I do with God. It's an interaction with God. So it's an exchange. Well, exchange of what? Well, it's an, it's an exchange where I let go of my sin, my guilt, my shame, maybe my anger towards myself and others. So that's the first part. It's where I'm letting go. I'm giving God permission to remove these things from my life. My sin, my guilt, my shame, my anger, everything connected with that. In exchange for, to receive, 
God's grace, transformation, and peace. So I, I want you to think of this, this court of priests as you, as you go through the temple process. You've gone through his courts with praise, and now you're entering into the court of priests. Now we're going to let God cleanse us of our sin by initiating with us, by brokering with us an exchange where I lay down on the altar things that I've been holding on to so that he can give me something else instead. Again, remember, if you didn't see your time with God as an exchange, this couldn't work. This, and so many of us have actually not experienced the power of forgiveness because we just think it's a decision I make to let go of certain feelings. But it's not. It's an exchange. Okay. Now, here, here's why I say this about forgiveness. This is not just my definition. It comes from a robust understanding of what the New Testament teaches, what Jesus opened up for us. So one of Jesus' favorite disciples, I can actually say that because John actually says, yeah, he's one of Jesus' favorite. The one that Jesus loved, he said, you know, not that, you know, God loves everyone, but he loves me best, like that kind of, that's how John felt. And I don't want to take that away from John. You know, John's a great guy and he got the book of Revelation revealed to him. So like, wow, right? So he's, he's something special. John wrote this. He said, if we walk in the light as he, who's he, God, as we, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Do you want fellowship with God? Then you need to walk in the light as he is in the light. What is this referring to? One of God's ways. You want to experience God. You want to bump into God. You're going to want to walk in the light because where, why? He's in the light. He is light, but he's also in the light. He's in that moment. And as we do that, the blood of Jesus, so the work Jesus already accomplished on that cross comes to bear on us. It's all the work is already done in, in terms of God, but now it needs to find its way into my own heart and set me free. Now, there are two kinds of words that, that inform my de definition of forgiveness, and I want to share them with you. So first one is purify. So his, his blood purifies us from all sin. And then number two, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now the word purify here is where we get the English word catharsis. If you know what catharsis is, it means a release right? A release of emotion, a release of bondage, a, a, a stepping into freedom, letting go, right? So it's talking about this emotional kind of release and, and a breaking free. The word forgive here, it literally means to send away. It means to, to pick up and carry away. So God says, I want to take your sins. I want to take your guilt. I want to take your shame. And I want to give you a catharsis. I want to set you free. I want to take those things. I want to pick them up. I want to carry them away. So this is why I'm calling it an exchange. It's not just a mental game I play where I go, technically, I guess I sinned. And then now in somewhere in the ledger books in heaven, God goes, check. And there, that's done. No, this is a real spiritual, emotional exchange with Jesus. But it's so incredibly powerful. Now, there's another key word that comes up three times in this passage. And it's this. It's the word if. If if, if. So all of these promises that I just talked about, this cleansing, this catharsis, is an if. It's not a guarantee. It's not an automatic. This only happens if. And the if, the first if, is if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. You want to encounter God and his cleansing work, you have to come into his light. I'm going to explain what that means in a minute. In other words, we need to let the power, I'm just going to do it now. I'm going to let the power of the Holy Spirit, the light, the truth of the Holy Spirit, illuminate my heart like a floodlight, poof, right? So that it shows me what's broken in me, shows me what's wrong, shows me my sin, so that God can then deal with it. So this is not comfortable, at all. But that's the first if. If you want that catharsis, if you want that freedom, you got to come in the light, let God shine his light on you and expose you. 
That's the first one. The second if and the third if are different sides of the same coin. So here they go. If we claim to be without sin, though, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. We can't experience the power of the gospel if we're not willing to acknowledge the sin. So what happens is we come into the light, God convicts us of a sin, and we're like, we justify it, we push it aside, we pretend it isn't there, we pretend God's not talking to us, we pretend or we make excuses for it and why we're technically off the hook this time. So if we deny our sin, we can't be free from it. Right? We have to own this thing. The other side is if we confess our sins, what happens? Then we get that forgiveness and purification, that catharsis, that freedom. He picks up that guilt and shame and he carries it away and we're set free. This is what I want to talk about today. How do you get into a space and let this happen? But first of all, we need to deal with our tendency to shy away from the light. Jesus puts it this way. He says, light has come into the world. That'd be him. But people love darkness instead of light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. You and I spend our whole lives trying to prevent the exposure of our weaknesses, of our flaws, and we hide. We hide from God. We don't present him with our true face. We hide from others. We don't want people to see our blemishes, our weaknesses, the, the, the rolls start to accumulate around our belly. We do everything in our power to not be exposed. And Jesus says, I want you to come to me and let me expose you because I'm the only one who loves you enough to accept you I've already paid for. The blood of Jesus has already paid for those sins. As far as he's concerned, they're forgiven. As far as you're concerned, they're not. So what he needs to do is help you appropriate what he's already purchased for you. But in order to do that, you've got to fully own up to what the problem is. You need to come into the light, to walk in the light as a way of life. This is what I'm learning to do every day. And this is what the court of priests is all about. So how do you get started? How do you start walking in the light? Well, obviously, this is not something we just want to do in our devotions. But remember, our devotions are a microcosm, a picture of how the rest of our life is going to go. So in my quiet time, I come into the light as practice for living in the light through the rest of the week. But I start with just asking him to reveal what's broken. It's as simple as that. Just ask him. So I, I use a prayer written by King David from Psalm 139, 23 and 24, and as kind of a, a baseline. I don't pray this exact prayer every day, but I, sometimes I do. But there, this is the idea. So David prays to God, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any offensive look at way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So he's saying, look, show me what's wrong with me. He's, I want to be right with you. I, I want to be in sync with you. I want to walk in your ways, but I'm walking my own way. I'm choosing, and it's destructive. So show me. So he's not just saying, show me if I did anything bad yesterday. He's saying, show me what I did wrong, but also if there are any patterns, any ways of behavior that start to emerge over time. And David would know that because he journaled his prayers. So as God revealed things, he'd come, he'd become aware of tendencies in his own heart over time, ways that were contrary to God's ways. And he says, lead me in the way everlasting. So that's the first thing. I just, I pray God, shine your light on me. Show me my ways. All right. Show me my sin. Show me how I'm broken. Show me where I'm not fully yours. And then I just listen. I just listen. I listen for his conviction. That Jesus says he promises that the Holy Spirit will come and convict the world in regards to sin, righteousness, and judgment. So there's the first one, sin. I'm letting him show me where I'm off. And he's not going to come to do it and condemn me because he's already convicted me of the fact that judgment has been paid for on the cross. So I'm not being judged. I'm being exposed so that he can set me free, so I can experience that catharsis. That's what he's doing. 
So I re- this is what I do. Because I journal, this is what I, I do. I think this is what David did probably do as well. Um, but uh, you could do it in your, in your mind as well. I really, really encourage you to write things down. I guarantee you you're missing out if you're not writing things down. I guarantee you 100% I'm willing to die on that hill. I don't like writing things down. I don't care. David did. The prophetic books are written down. Think of, think of how much richness is there that we can go back to and refer to because it's written down in scriptures. What if they hadn't written it down? Eh, God knows, right? Mm. So this is really important. So write stuff down, even if it's bullet you know, points, point form. Um, but I review in my mind, I walk through yesterday, my conversations, my interactions, my attitudes, and I let God highlight things inside of me. Uh, words, actions, attitudes that are not like Jesus. And here's, here are the kinds of things God brings up in me. So just kind of to give you an idea, like, so you're not just like spitballing, trying to come up with something. Okay. I'm also, by the way, reviewing what I've just vented to God. So the things I've just said, blah, I'm just, remember I'm, I, when I was ascending, I was venting some things. If there's anything in there that God wants to highlight, I let him do that as well. Again, if I haven't written those things down, I probably don't remember. So that's a hint. What are you supposed to do? Write it down. Okay. So here are some things that are not like Jesus or, or maybe indications that they're not fully his. For example, uh, he might show me unhealthy habits, tendencies or addictions, or my attitudes like entitlement or pride, selfishness, denial, unbiblical ideas like thoughts, doubts, or beliefs, uh, things like contempt in my heart or unforgiveness or a critical spirit, insecurities, low self-esteem, suspiciousness, fears, worry, apathy, guilt, shame, defensiveness, (laughs) discouragement, despair, unhealed wounds. These aren't sins per se, but these are things that are broken that he wants me to bring into the light. And then t- how, is there anything about how I'm handling my time or my money or my possessions or my relationships or my leisure? You get the idea. These are things that Jesus wants to talk about. And again, these are not distractions. These are the point. He's, why? Because he wants me to give myself more fully to him so that he can transform me into Christ's image. And that, in, in all of that, I'm going to get to know him better. So this is why we're doing what we do. So I, I just, I ask God to show me these things. I sit in it and then I listen for his conviction. As it comes up, I write it down. So I, I go, and I don't argue, I just write it down. I just write, this is what I'm sensing. Mm, yeah, you know what, that, that conversation, I was a little critical. And I, I just, I, go, I don't justify anything, I just write things down. Because this is exciting, because he's showing me things that aren't like Jesus. And if we can fix those things, I'm gonna be more like Jesus. I'm going to experience more of the peace and joy of Jesus. Are you getting it? Okay. The third step then is to fully confess your sin, to fully confess it. Uh, The word confess uh, in this passage, it literally means to agree with. So in other words, God calls you out on something. Now is not the time to go, okay, yeah, but see, here's the thing. Sun was in my eyes. It was a windy day. I was super grumpy. I wasn't quite myself. I didn't sleep very well. My kids were really bugging me. There was a lot on my mind. And so technically I should be off the hook. Yeah. No. Just don't justify. Fully confess it, which means owning it. Own that thing. Okay. Just, yup, I did that. And, and the, here's, here's the thing. Uh, I can't even count how many times where as I go through this this process with God every day where God shows me something about a situation or something in my heart and I don't agree with him. Like I'm like, really? That? Okay, you're going you're gonna to focus. Okay. But he's God, right? So his ways are right. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So you've shown me this for a reason. You're God. I'm not. So I'm sorry. I show me, and we're going to get into this next week. Why was this such a bad thing? That's the process of repentance. So I'm going to get into that in a minute, or uh, sorry, not in a minute, in a week. Um, but here's, here's the, here's the thing that I think a lot of people get stuck on when it comes to confession. And that is that no amount of sin against me can ever justify responding with sin of my own. No amount of sin against me can ever justify me responding with sin of my own. So what we need to do is we need to learn to separate what other people do to us and how we respond to them. So somebody is, let's say, greedy and violent and mean, and they do something that hurts me badly, and I 
punch him in the eye, okay? I'm just oversimplifying. So I punch him in the eye, ha! Right? So now, the next day, I'm sitting down for my quiet time, if God hasn't done it already, and, I'm, and he's like, hey, so you, you punched Jack in the eye, or John, or whatever his name was in the, the office, and you're like, oh, that guy! He's just, he was undermining me, and he was, he was talking behind my back. He totally deserved it. And what we're saying when we do that is that I'm not to blame. There's nothing I need to confess. Why? Because someone sinned against me. So what you're saying is if someone sins against you, you never are complicit in anything. Well, no. But he deserved it. He totally deserved it. Oh, and I can just imagine, just imagine having a conversation with God. It's like, oh, he deserved it. Okay, so what we're saying is mercy's off the table. What's mercy? not getting what we deserve. So what you're saying is, Brad, you're not willing to extend mercy to him. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not. Why? Because he deserved it. Okay, so if we're taking mercy off the table in this transaction, it's off your table too. And I go, duh, 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 whoa, ha, ha, pull that back. I need God's mercy. Otherwise, if I get what I deserve, I'm in huge trouble. So what are we going to give him instead? Oh, we're going to give him what he doesn't deserve, which is grace. Right? So no amount of sin against me can justify me responding with sin of my own. Um, and that's what we're going to do. Now, what I, again, I'm going to show you this, this graphic here um, that kind of summarizes this process again. Ask God to reveal what's broken, listen for his conviction, and then fully confess your sin. If you want to download a PDF, a free PDF, just scan that QR code there. I think the link will probably be in the video notes as well, uh, beneath the video, or if you're on Manifest Online, should be in the notes section there. Just download that QR code, or click that QR code, scan the QR code, download a free PDF, and it's going to summarize what I'm talking about here right now. Now, um, in closing, I just want to wrap with one more set of instructions that I, I think you're going to find really helpful, and I've had to actually help so many people with, because uh, i got to tell you that when I come into the cross court, I call it the cross court, the court of priests, and, and I, I confess my sin, I, I 99% of the time, I feel completely released already, and I don't have to go through these steps, because these are like training wheels, and now the training wheels have come off, and, and I'm just interacting with God on this. But Often we need help, and there's no shame in that. So what, what I'm talking about is, you might go through these steps. You ask God to show you what's broken, right? And he shows you something about your attitude or pattern in your life. You confess it to him. You totally own up to, him, to this, this thing, and you still feel guilty. You still feel guilty. So what do you do? You still feel shame. What do you do? Here's some advice that I would give you. Number one, I would say, let yourself feel it. Don't deny it. Don't go, huh, that's weird. Pfft, well, I shouldn't feel it, so I don't. That's a lie. <laughs> you do, and own that. Remember what the point of this exercise is, to become more like Jesus, to, to, to give him stuff that's not fully his. So you just found something else that's not fully his, that's good, because now he can deal with it in your life. So we're going to acknowledge now. We're going to let those feelings come up. We're going to acknowledge them to God. All that guilt, all that shame, we're going to do that. Why? Because he's going to, he wants to take that shame away. Do you remember what we read in that scripture, that the new and living way Jesus opened up for us, uh, was opened up to us? We should approach God with confidence. Why? Because he will cleanse our consciences with, with water. He will cleanse our consciences. What was the old system unable to do? Cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. So it's important to God that your conscience is cleaned. It's clear. The guilt is gone. The shame is gone. So don't just move on as though it's just a decision. No, it's a catharsis. It's an encounter. It's an exchange. And you're not done yet with your confession until you feel free from it. Because God doesn't want you to walk around going, I really wish I had no guilt and shame. He's like, what does that have to do with anything? The ledger in heaven, you're clear. Move on. No, what's the, he loves us. The point of the whole thing is he wants us free. Not that he can cross something off in his book. Okay, so this is what God wants for you. All right, so let yourself feel any and all guilt and shame. You still have, it's still residual. And then number two, you're going to focus on the cross 
I actually visualize the cross when, when I go through this. I, I visualize Jesus on the cross, dying for me, paying for that sin, and wiping it away forever. Okay, so I picture Jesus paying the ultimate price to forgive me of that sin. And then number three, I invite Jesus to come and lift that guilt and shame from my soul. Remember what forgive means, to pick up and carry away. So now I invite Jesus, come and do that. I often ask myself, do I want this guilt and shame? No, I don't want it. And if I do, it means I'm trying to punish myself, which is another thing that needs to become like Jesus. But I, but I just say, no, I don't want this guilt and shame. Then I, then I go, okay, Jesus, would you come and lift it away? This is what you came to do. You promised you will cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. So I'm here now. Would you come and do that? Lift it away and replace it with your grace and peace. Okay? Sometimes I actually picture this happening. Like it's like, boo, Jesus pulls something off of me and then pours something with the sound effects. Of course, that's because I'm a Hubert. So it pours in, in through me. Oh, I'm getting chills just talking about it. And then um, it, af, after this, if, if I'm not already feeling you know, the, the, the freedom, I'll ask Jesus then, after I've gone through this process, Jesus, what would you like me to know? about this sin or in this moment what would you like me to know and he will speak things to you he will show you pictures in your mind he will he will give you impressions or suddenly you'll just feel free whatever it is this is how you can deal with your emotions so this is uh, again I'm giving you some biblical framework for the ways of God. This is how we move through confession. This is what confession is supposed to look like. And now I've also given you about 30 years of experience uh, distilled down into some things that you can try at home that, again, you might want to make your own or change up. But I'm telling you that this process in the temple is supposed to lead us to this point where we're giving ourselves more fully to him by confessing our sin and receiving his catharsis, his freedom.